the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 710, for Monday, May 21st, 2018. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show that takes your questions, we take your tips, we take your cool stuff found, and we mix them all together. It's really more of a, like this morning, we're recording this in the morning, so uh, we're not having salad. Maybe it's like a frittata of all sorts of tasty ingredients that are meant to inform, delight, and entertain all at once. Sponsors for this episode include Eero Mesh Routers, where coupon code MGG saves you on uh, the overnight shipping fees here in the U.S. and Canada. We'll talk more about uh, more about them later in the show. Of course, the show being the show with the goal of consuming that frittata and learning at least five new things here in 2018. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here... In Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. F. Braun, today? Eh, I'm doing okay. Good. Good. Good stuff. Though my house is falling apart, but... Uh. Aren't they Aren't they all? I mean, that's like our job as homeowners is to, to stay, hopefully stay one step ahead of or catch up to nature, uh, who is constantly trying to return our homes back to the earth in uh, every way possible with bugs and, and, uh, and weather. And all of those things and sunlight and, you know, right. Yeah. It's just how it works. It's just disconcerting to find, even after all these years, there are still some surprise design surprises or poorly uh, work that was poorly done yeah. or not thought out. But yes. Yes. Yeah. That's how it goes though. That's sort of the fun, right? It's like, uh, it's like you get to go on a treasure hunt every time there's a, uh, there's a problem with your home. So I, you know, while we're uh, not on the subject of Mac stuff, I will say this. I, I had, I won't go through all the details, but I had a, an issue with my car where three of the four taillights basically all died within the same period of time. It's because they're LEDs and there was a crappy uh, step down converter in there. And so I replaced it. Somebody online had figured out how to do this with a $6 thing. So it cost me $24 and about an hour and a half. And my son and I did it, but the, uh, it, which was great. It was fun. And now it's fixed. But the uh, the reason I bring this up is during that repair, we used two things for an electronics repair that I had never used before. And I know this is one of them is going to sound really stupid, but one was a hot glue gun. We had to to fix this new step down converter into place. And so just having a hot glue gun in the house, which we've had for kids crafts for you know decade, uh, was really super handy because it really did exactly what we needed. And it allowed us to kind of mount it where we wanted to and still leave airflow where we wanted to and all that stuff. So um, so that's a handy thing to have um, or remember that you have, because I, I, my guess is like like me, a lot of you probably have these things for other reasons. And then. This is going to sound ridiculous, but uh, I <laughs> though I have had a package like a huge bulk package of heat shrink tubing for years. I've never used it for an electronics project. I used it initially uh, because the the um, what do you call it? There's a name for it. The thing in the back of your glasses that sort of wraps around your ear that like that had like eroded or broken off on one pair of glasses that I wore like around the house or whatever. Watching TV, I really only wear them for distance. And, uh, and it was, you know, bothering my ear. And I, I thought, oh, I could get some heat shrink tubing and, and just, you know, like put a couple of sleeves on there and, and sort of rebuild this thing, which is exactly what I did. Uh, but I finally used it for an electronics project instead of wrapping, you know, tape around something to, to separate it. I just put some heat shrink tubing on and with a little lighter and boom, everything was good to go. It was way faster. So, and you can get a thing at heat shrink tubing from Amazon for, you know, all different like diameters for, uh. I don't know. I mean, it's like five bucks or something ridiculous and you'll probably never use it all and pass it along to your children as an heirloom or something. So heat shrink tubing and glue guns, because mm -hmm. why not? Have you ever used heat shrink tubing, John? I know this is like, oh, sure. perhaps I'm, I'm like discovering, you know, fire again, but uh, you know, there you go. It's, it's interesting stuff, you know? 
Yeah? Yeah? You've, y- right. Yes, you've used it? Uh, not recently. Hmm. Well, it's good to have around the house. It's fun. Uh, yeah, all right. Let's go to the show. Ken, ha- we'll, we'll start off with some tips. And Ken said, uh, a tip I didn't know. I had no idea that I could use the function key, the FN key, on the keyboard and the arrow keys up and down to scroll the app window up and down. He says, I first tried it in mail and then I realized it works in all the apps that I have. And he's right. It's, it's just like using the, the scroll key on your, uh, on your keyboard or on your, on your uh, scroll wheel on your mouse. It just kind of moves things. Um, I think it moves a page at a time actually with the, with the function key. So, uh, so there you go. It's really handy. And, and of course, like in Safari, if you're just in a regular view, you can hit the space bar to scroll down. And of course, because option always does the opposite option space bar will scroll up. But uh, what's cool about function and arrow is it allows you to scroll even if you're in an edit window, because if you start, if you hit the space bar while you're in an edit window, obviously it's going to just insert a space into the edit window. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Anything to add to that, John? Yeah, I found if uh, if you do command arrow, that does something interesting as well. Well, what does it do? Should I do it while well, we're goes, recording here? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I did it on our uh, our page there. Uh, it goes to the top or top or bottom. Oh no, kidding! Huh? And then he also mentioned function left and right actually goes to the beginning or end of the line. Oh yeah! Look at that. Oh, I like this. I didn't even know that. I just. I'm like, oh, I wonder what all the other modifier keys will do with the arrows. Wow. Uh, huh. That's pretty good, man. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Cool. All right. This is why we do this show. I think I've already learned uh, three new things. So look at that. We're, we're almost finished. Quick one today. <laughs> all right. Uh, listener John is up next. And he says, uh, it is relating back a few shows ago, we were talking about serial numbers and, and why it's important to keep them and all that stuff. And he says, uh, I had something happen to me for the third time and wanted to pass it along. If you have just done a repair with Apple or a third party, and as part of that repair, you've replaced the motherboard on your computer and suddenly your iMessage is failing, you will now know why. He says, uh, because serial numbers for computers are printed on the outer case when a motherboard is replaced. The motherboard has to be coded with the serial number. This is a one-time flash and can't be changed. Can't be changed once it's put in, but sometimes Apple forgets to do it. And you will know if you go to the Apple menu and choose about this Mac, uh, if no serial number shows up in the window, then you don't have a serial number encoded on your motherboard. Uh, He says, you will have to go back to Apple with your computer to get it flashed properly. He says, or you can Google Foo and Torrent. He says, the utility is out there in places. The cool part is that the reason iMessage fails to work is because uh, part of the endpoint encryption for iMessage is based on your system's serial number as hard-coded to the motherboard. So we talked about iMessage having end-to-end encryption in the last episode, part of the key for each device. You actually get a per-device key because that's the only way it could do that uh, without being insecure. Is uh, and, and part of that key is the motherboard. He says iMessage is based on your system serial number as hard-coded to the motherboard. Without a serial number, the encryption uh, algorithm cannot initialize and will fail to communicate. This can also apparently cause problems with app store licensing, push messaging, and software updates. So in any case, just a side note that can be really annoying to track down. So if you get your motherboard replaced and suddenly you can't send iMessage anymore, uh, check to see if you have a serial number. In fact, I think as a preemptive strike, if you get your motherboard replaced, check to see if you have a serial number and avoid uh, waiting for these symptoms to show up. So... And uh, as Warren in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream is saying, this is why Hackintoshes don't get iMessages or FaceTime. I had no idea that was a limitation of Hackintoshes these days. But it makes total sense, given, uh, given what we just discussed. Thoughts on that, John? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, of course, you can find that if you go to About This Mac, and it's listed right there. But, right. Um, also, if you go to the system report and you look at the hardware, I think this is another value that's used by a lot of things. It's called the hardware UUID, which is a unique value for that machine alone. And I think that changes per <clears throat> motherboard, right? It, 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 is that hard-coded? I, I guess it is, right? The UUID? I mean, like if I, I, I the reason, uh, yeah, let me, let me uh, explain my thinking because th what I just said probably doesn't make a lot of sense because of course it's a hardware UUID. Why would it change? I know there's some UUID that changes with each reinstallation of Mac OS. Like if you were to wipe your hard drive clean, um, there is a UUID perhaps for the volume, which makes sense that would change. And I'm just curious what, uh. If, if this one persists, I mean, I imagine it does. It would, it would otherwise, why would it be a hardware UUID? Yeah. And I remember actually, uh, some software, another thing is that, uh, you know, if you get a repair, your Mac addresses may change. I know that, um, a lot of software, um, on other platforms or one strategy was, well, let me, you know, marry myself to the, uh, ethernet, uh, you know, uh, Mac address or something like that. I remember having to diagnose something that had to do with that. Cause yeah, we, we used a different network interface or, or something. And all of a sudden the machine, the, the software were saying, Hey, I'm, I'm on the wrong machine. And it's like, no, you're, you're on the right machine. Oh, interesting. So huh. this can be a pain in the neck. If you, uh, do a restore to, um, <clears throat> if you restore from a backup and then all of a sudden all your stuff is, uh, you know, including iMessage, it's right. not working. It could be because any one of those values have changed. Then Apple has the magic tools that can set them to what they were before. Uh, very interesting. Huh. Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> hmm. uh, all right. Uh, shall we move on, my friend? Sure. Sure. All right. Let's uh, let's take it to Scott. Scott actually has an audio comment. So, uh, Scott, why don't you take it away? Hi, this is Scott from Virginia. A few episodes ago, you had a listener asking if it was possible to restore minimized windows from the app switcher. And one suggestion was to use a program called Keyboard Maestro. Well, there's actually a way to do this without any additional software. It's a bit tricky at first, but all you have to do is press command tab as you normally would. And when you have the app that you want selected... Keep the command key held down, but instead of pressing tab to advance to the next app, press and hold the option key. Then let go of the command key. This will open the most recent minimized window for that application. Or if no windows are open for that app, it will make a new window for certain apps like the Finder, Text Edit, etc. Hope this helps and thanks for the great show. Very true. Very good, Scott. Uh, the one thing I will say about that tip, just so you guys don't get caught with it, is uh, it will only restore a minimized window if that if all of the windows are minimized. If there is a maximized window, it will not bring it up. Um, it will it, it will bring the maximized window up. It will not bring the minimized one up. But um, but that's I like it. That's handy. That little uh, roll of the hand to make that that jump from command to option. I like it. Good, John. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, we have a note from another Scott. We'll, we'll kind of dive into uh, a little bit of mesh Wi-Fi here. And, and, and I will remind you, of course, that Eero is the sponsor of this episode. We'll, we'll probably be talking uh, both positively and negatively about, about Eero. We'll be talking honestly about it. I don't know whether it'd be positive or negative. Then we'll do the sponsor spot later, but I always just like to be, I like to make sure people know that we're, you know, um, our sponsor spots don't uh, don't influence our our thoughts on things, but but our thoughts on things do influence uh, who we allow on as sponsors. So there you go, um, Scott. I think this is a different Scott, but it could be the same. He says, um, in the course of the your episodes, there is a active discussion slash debate about various Wi-Fi and mesh solutions. He says after my airport. Routers finally gave up the ghost. I decided it was time to do some research of my own and get meshed. After comparing stats, reviews, and prices, 
I purchased both the Eero and Google Wi-Fi devices. I returned the Eero package within a week for one simple reason. Google Wi-Fi performed equally well for me, or better in some cases, and at a far lower price. I rarely hear this product mentioned on a show and wanted to give it a shout out uh, because it is elegantly designed, inexpensive, extremely functional, and simple to set up. It allows some geek level tweaking, but most isn't necessary. Just uh, one take out of the box, uh, designate it as the main unit or take one out of the box, designate it as the main unit and add the rest by scanning a QR code and just plugging them in. Nothing against your says may make a fine product, but I just couldn't see spending the extra money for it when the Google Wi-Fi devices did the same job for me for much less. In the end, it leaves me more money to buy other stuff you guys recommend. And that's a good thing, right? Says I get I guess you could say the extra money I would have paid for the Eero didn't get caught. Uh, there you go. OK. Um, yeah, I, you know what? I agree that Google Wi-Fi works well in terms of the dual radio, um, mesh systems, the dual band, I guess is the right way to call it. Um, that's the, uh, that, that was one of the best performers when we tested, we don't really obsess about speed a whole lot. Uh, when I, I at least I don't, when talking about these mesh products, because by and large, they all do perform, you know, fast enough, right? For what what most of us have in our homes, uh, given you know, with some with some exceptions, of course. But um, my only issue with Google Wi Fi is the amount of attention that they pay to it, and that is the the low amount of attention that they pay to it. Software updates kind of roll out here or there. Um, but in terms of just like getting their attention and maybe this is because I'm kind of on the inside, but like even getting their PR department's attention about it. I mean, they're, they'll engage. It's they're fine, but they're definitely not proactive about this. They're not really, this doesn't, this product does not appear to me like a priority for them, which given Google's history is not surprising, right? We've seen a lot of products that they just sort of, you know, they throw a lot of things at the wall and see what sticks. There's nothing wrong with the Google Wi-Fi. Like I said, I've, I've tested it and price wise, you know, especially for a dual band, uh, it's it's pretty inexpensive. You may Scott may have been com comparing it to the Euro tri-band stuff because all the Gen 2 Euro um, main Euro units anyway, the base units are all tri-band. And so that adds the extra five gigahertz channel, which can really help with uh, with, you know, faster backhaul. So if you're doing a lot of multi hop stuff, meaning you're connecting to a mesh point and then that mesh point is relaying your signal back to the, the quote unquote router unit, um, having, a, you know, the extra radio can in depending on the layout of your home and how you're doing things that can actually really make a difference or it can make zero difference at all. And uh, and so, uh, you know. That that that's why you don't hear me talk as about Google Wi-Fi as as much as I do. I do have one set up uh, very close by here with a at a at a you know kind of I have the I have these test houses sort of around and uh, you know friends and family members and clients that you know are the right type of people uh, for me to have test these things I have I have them going so that I can have all of these mesh systems actually in production as opposed to in just like little you know. Uh, controlled environments that I would do here. I can just have them running and then I get to hear what real people say about them and all that stuff. And the real people that have Google Wi-Fi love it um, in my test case here. So uh, and it could because it just works. They're not geeks. They don't care about, you, you know, things like the Google Wi-Fi currently isn't doing anything to prevent against buffer bloat, uh, but they don't do anything where that's a problem. Uh, we'll talk about how Eero just added some features to fix that, but uh, I'm saving that for the sponsor spot. But, um, but you know, it'll support Ethernet backhaul and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. You know, I, like hardware wise, I have no problem with it. I just worry about the longevity of it. Maybe maybe I worry too much. Thoughts on that, John? Before we move on, well, Google does have a history of losing interest in things. That's exactly it, and and their interest in this doesn't appear to be uh, high. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. Then again, I mean, Euro is a, a you know fairly new uh, company, so, right? Um, 
Well, and they are a single purpose company, right? Like if, mm-hmm. if Eero stops being interested in their mesh product, well, well, they better pivot to something else because otherwise they have no revenue, right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so you, you know, like they're, they're, they're focused. Not to say that there aren't some engineers at Google that aren't focused on Google Wi-Fi, but it doesn't seem like a priority. That's all. What do I know? Uh, let's go to Bill, shall we? And, uh, Bill, uh Oh, what did I do? There we are. Uh, it, Bill kind of brings us into, you know, what I call the quasi mesh uh, realm because you can certainly create a mesh without buying something called mesh. He says, I've been running a time capsule as my router, uh, and wireless access point and for wireless and wired ethernet storage for a time for my time machine backups. Um, he says, I recently added a Synology RT 2600 AC to my network to use as my router and wireless access point and to add um, 802.11 AC, which my time capsule didn't have and to add QoS. He says, my question is how do I configure the time capsule to still be able to access the hard disk for wireless time machine backups? First, I presume I put the time capsule router function in bridge mode. Second, uh, do I put the wireless capability in extend a wireless network or off? And uh, he says, it, number three, if I turn the wireless off, how do computers access the time capsule? Do I connect the time capsule to the RT2600 AC by Ethernet or USB? Uh, so uh, some good questions. The, as for your time capsule, the way I've done it um, until the drive died in mine, I think you were kind of in the same boat, John, is I set mine to bridge mode. I had another device as a router, right? Where you've got your Synology, which is great. Um, and I set mine to bridge mode Wi-Fi disabled. Um, in that config, the time capsule would be accessible to any device that can see the Ethernet network. And since, and this is the important part, um, yes, the time capsule has both Wi-Fi and Ethernet in it. And I've, I've, I've encountered this before where because it has those things, the assumption is that if you turn the Wi-Fi off, then Wi-Fi clients might not be able to connect to the hard drive that's inside the time capsule. But generally, that's not the way your network is configured. Um, in this case, your Synology router is providing your Wi-Fi and your routing c- capability. But... What it's also doing is bridging all of your network. So when we say that we're putting a router in bridge mode, really, we're just turning off the routing functionalities. The bridging in most senses uh, is still happening, right? The bridging happens all the time. So your Synology router bridges on your local network, Wi-Fi and Ethernet. And then because the router is turned on, it also routes traffic in and out from the Internet. So... Having bridge mode enabled on your time capsule means that things that are connecting over Ethernet uh, are, you know, are basically it means it, its router is off and it's just an Ethernet device at that point. It could also be a Wi-Fi device. And we'll talk about that. Um, but because your Synology bridges Wi-Fi to Ethernet, then anything that's connected Ethernet, including your time capsule, will be visible to your Wi-Fi clients. And that's why that would work. Does that make sense before we uh, before we move on from this, John? Yeah, no, it's been a while since uh, since I think I had to do that as well when yep. I was phasing it out. But um, yep, or he could pull the drive out of it. I think well, they did that too. Yeah, then he has to put it. Well, then yeah. To, I mean, if the for what re- wait for what reason? I I, just, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of reasons for why, but like which were well, just if you're going to decommission that device mm. no i think he still wants to use it for his time machine backups until uh until the drive dies i think that's kind of his point right yeah yeah um, i mean once i decommissioned mine i i actually took the hard drive and put it in uh i think i put it in one of my trobos like, oh, okay i'm not gonna use this anymore yeah 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 huh smart yeah yeah I, I a lot of those had well actually if it's lasted this long but a lot of yeah. The, the later units had power supply issues and that it'll just die. Yeah, that was that was the issue I had with mine. But thankfully, because I had it connected to an Apple Care covered Mac, they uh, repaired the power supply 
as part of Apple Care. So there was like, yeah, okay. I mean, that I, I don't, I, I don't know if Apple Care kind of goes that far anymore. I think, I think the only, uh, it, it goes, I don't know, but, but used to, they used to do that anyway. So, um, on this though, if you wanted, and, and again, I, I'm not sure I would recommend this, but in the, in the whole quasi mesh scenario, if you wanted your time capsule to be a part of your wireless network in terms of extending your wireless network. So now we're talking, you know, that quasi mesh mode where you've got, you know, other, you've got your main router, which has a, you know, wireless access point in it. And then you want to put other wireless access points around the house because your time capsule is connected to ethernet. You would not use the extend a wireless network setting because generally what that will do is it will try to sort of be a wireless relay. You don't want wireless relay. You want to use Ethernet backhaul, not Wi-Fi backhaul. So in this case, it seems weird. But what you would do is you, again, keeping your time capsule in bridge mode so that it doesn't try to do any routing, you would set your time capsule to turn to create a Wi-Fi network. And then and this would be true of any router, any router that you want to use as a quasi mesh. Right. So we're, we're using the time capsule as an example. It's actually kind of a bad example only because the wireless radios in it are not 802.11 AC. Um, no, maybe. May, well, maybe his aren't. Did they ever make an AC time capsule? I guess maybe they did. Um, so you <laughs> could do this, but really with any router, you'd put it into bridge mode. So you'd turn off its routing capabilities and then. You tell it to create a wireless network, just like you normally would if it were a router, right? So no special settings, except that you give it the same SSID or network name as your main router has and the same security settings. So if you're using WPA2, which you should be, uh, set it to that and give it the same password. You could and probably should use different channels for the radios on your main router versus your uh, access points, you know, your, your quasi mesh points there so that they don't overlap with each other, but you've got to use something like iStumbler to dig into that and, um, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you're not overlapping with your neighbors and, and all of that. So there's, there's a little bit of, uh, sort of situational decisions that need to be made, but otherwise, yeah, uh, you set it to different channels, but that's the trick is putting it into bridge mode and then um, creating a Wi-Fi network with the same credentials and name. And that will allow your devices to just connect to either or. And again, it's a quasi mesh. It's not doing the, some of the handoff. It's not doing the centralized management of anything because the two devices, you know, in this case, the time capsule and the Synology router don't know about each other. But that's okay. You know, it, it, it can work. Uh, I ran something that way for like 10 years here before mesh really, you know, caught on. And it works great, especially if you've got Ethernet in the walls. Um, there are some performance efficiencies that you don't get. But by and large, it, it, it'll work pretty well for you, I think. So thoughts about this, John? <clears throat> yeah, that's... <laughs> I just jump straight to mesh. But, um. Right, 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 right. Well, you, you know, like for a lot of folks, one router is either enough or almost enough in, in your home such that you didn't need to like go nuts and figure out, okay, crap, how am I going to, you know, solve this problem? Like for me, it, because of how spread out like the house and, and the property is, I had to figure this out right away. Like there was just no option. But um, but for most folks, you don't, you know, it's like, eh, it's OK. Yeah, there's a dead spot over there. It's not as fast over there or whatever. Um, and that's why mesh entering the market really was sort of a blessing because it we're totally able to have our cake and eat it, too, without having to like geeky engineer a, a solution. And it's not so much engineering it. I mean, we just talked through it at a, from a top level. It's like, yeah, OK, you can, you know, fine. Makes sense. But it's the management of it. Like when things don't work, you're like, okay, well now I, I have good news. I only have four different places to look or whatever it is, you know, whereas with, you know, with some, one of these mesh products, you know, you just, just one place to look 
and it tells you everything that's going on, which is really super handy. Makes life way easier. Anything more on that, John, before I jump to our, uh, our Eero sponsor block here? Let's go. All right, cool. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the uh, intro to the show, Eero is our sponsor for this episode. And Eero is, as far as I know, the longest running consumer mesh uh, creator in, in the market. And it shows, right? They're already on their second generation systems, which, as I mentioned here in the show, include a tri-band radio in the Eero Gen 2, but also their second generation product introduced the Eero Beacon, which is a really cool thing. It just plugs right into an outlet and sits right on the outlet. Like there's no cord. It just plugs in and joins your Eero mesh and does its thing and relays these things around uh, and really can make it super easy to get this stuff, uh, you know, anywhere in your home. The cool thing about Eero, and I've seen other mesh products that don't do this well, is that you can mix and match Eero's from first generation, second generation. So if you've got a first generation Eero and you want to add, you know, some beacons or even you want to add a second generation point so that you've got the tri-band in one spot and dual band in another. No problem. Just all works together. No issues whatsoever. In fact, uh, I do that very often here at the house. Very, very cool stuff. And as we've mentioned, you know, the single router thing just doesn't work for a lot of folks. Eero, I'm going to take this one a little bit longer because Eero just added a feature that we that really matters to us. And, you know, we talk a lot of, on this show about QoS. So this is sort of the content portion of the of the ad that I'm sort of blending together today. So this one will go a little long. Um, th we talk a lot about QoS and there's a lot of things that fall under the QoS umbrella. The one that is important to uh, most of us and, and the one that we focus on here when we say QoS, what we mean is that scenario when all of your devices or even just one is using all of your upstream bandwidth, either to upload your photos to iCloud Photo Library or, uh, you know, back up to a place like, you know, Backblaze or, you know, whatever. And that then slows down everything else because your upstream pipe is now soaked and not properly managed. Well, the act or the technology that properly manages that is called, is part of QoS. Eero introduced uh, with version 2.17, something called SQM, which is smart queue management. Smart queue management is not Eero's term. It is a term as part of the whole QoS discussion. And this is it. By managing that queue of data that's going out, it can control it and make sure that no one bit of traffic is causing thing, everything else to slow down. And this is now available. So you can enable this. Go to uh, open your Eero app, tap on the menu button, Tap on network settings, tap on Eero Labs, and switch the toggle to on. Very, very cool stuff, what they're doing over there. And they're staying right on top of these products. It's, it's great to see. Uh, I was really impressed they were able to add this uh, sort of after the fact to even, you know, the, the Gen 1 stuff. So very cool. Uh, and we have a deal for you. As I mentioned in the show intro, you can get free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada uh, by visiting Eero.com. Pick whatever, you know, products you want, packages, all of that stuff. And then at checkout, select overnight shipping and then enter our special promo code MGG and that will make the shipping free. Again, uh, go to Eero.com and at checkout, select overnight shipping and then enter promo code MGG and that will make it free for all of you in the U.S. and Canada. And our sincere thanks to Eero for being a sponsor of this episode. Good, right, John? That QoS thing's pretty cool. You've, uh, what, what have you done to, uh, yeah, I have, haven't actually uh, tested it. So the way I test it is, because uh, that's a really good question. Um, the way I test it is I start, I open up a terminal window and I start pinging a server out on the internet. And generally speaking, I use ping space www.apple.com, right? And that gets a ping trail going. And and you can just kind of look at that and see what, what a ping is, is it sends out 
a uh, request to a server one per second. And in this case, the server is www.apple.com. And then apple.com responds by saying, yep, I'm here. That turnaround time is reported in milliseconds uh, as part of this. And it's doing it one per second. If you want to stop a ping, control C in the terminal will stop it. Otherwise, it just keeps going, which is great for this next test. So run that for, I don't know, you know, 10, 15, 20 seconds and you'll get a feel right for me. Uh, I just started running it while we started doing the segment because that's how I go. And, you know, my average is about 25 milliseconds. Yours might be remarkably different from that. Hopefully it's not triple digits. If it is, that's not such a good thing, especially Well, I was going to say, especially if you're in the U.S., but I think Apple's got servers all over the place. So really, it shouldn't happen anywhere. But uh, unless you're on a connection with a lot of latency, you know, and there's a lot of turnaround to there, a lot of time for it to turn that packet around. So the idea is you get this ping going because it tests how long it takes for a packet to get out of your network and come back in. And then I'll just go to like speedtest.net or whatever, and, or I'll start a, you know, an online backup or something and I will do my speed test and I will watch those pings as the download happens and as the upload happens. And that will tell me uh, if I'm experiencing what's called buffer bloat. Right. Where if those ping times increase, meaning it takes more time for a packet to do a round trip, if those ping times increase during either the download or the upload test, then I know I have a QoS issue here, most likely um, because, you know, that using you're using all your bandwidth, at least in theory, depending on how much speed you have on your Internet connection, sometimes speed test can't see all of it on the downstream. But for most of us here in the U.S., especially those of us that aren't on fiber, uh, those of us on cable connections, it can certainly use all of our upstream. And that's really where QoS matters the most is on a cable modem connection with the upstream connection. So. So that's how I test it, John. Did you do any of that testing while we were talking here? No. Hmm. Okay, cool. So have you have you have you enabled uh SQM in yes. uh on your era? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I moved the slider. Right. Yeah, that I was able to handle. Yeah, no, I I tested it that way um and it I mean it absolutely makes a difference. It does it does exactly what it's supposed to do and those ping times don't right. change. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, there you go. That's how I test QoS. You also can use the um, speedtest.net. No, sorry. DSLreports.com slash speedtest will let you um, will sort of do that for you and give you a buffer bloat score. Uh, but that's what it's doing is it's starting a It does it all within your browser. Um, but uh, but yeah, DSL reports spring to DSL reports speed test. Easy for me to say, but that'll, that'll do it in the browser. I, I prefer to do it manually because that way I can see what's going on and, you know, I get a feel for how much something is impacting it. Like, it, you know, that kind of thing. And that's what they're doing too. They're just applying a, you know, a, a grade to it, a plus down to F. So good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mo moving on. Okay, cool. In, uh, in episode 709, which of course was our. Uh, penultimate was that the right is that the right word to use i don't know our, our our most recent episode before this one i don't know but it's not like this is the last episode this is just the most recent episode unless you're listening to this like a year from now and then it's not at all the most recent in episode 709 which was our prior episode we talked about how frustrating it was for me uh and many of us with iphone 10s to have to to be told to ask Siri something while we're driving and have our phones say you need to unlock your phone, of course, which means either, you know, looking at the phone with face ID or uh, entering your passcode, neither of which are really good uh, things to do while you're driving. I, I think I think, in fact, they're really bad things to do while you're driving. I'd much rather have a fingerprint sensor where I can just float it, especially if I'm telling Siri to do something like, you know, hey, launch ways. Uh, that's sort of a thing and it happens if your phone goes to sleep. So, uh, Eduardo wrote in and, uh, uh, where are we here? Oh, I had the wrong thing up. 
Yeah, of course I did. Eduardo wrote in and he says, uh, on mine, on my iPhone 10, he says, when the do not do not disturb while driving feature is enabled, Siri doesn't ask to unlock the phone first. He says, I tested it without do not disturb while driving enabled, and it did ask to unlock. So I tried this last night and uh, I re-enabled do not disturb while driving. And then I drove and it was enabled. And, you know, it was obvious because when I invoked Siri, the uh, the screen looks different, right? You you just see like a little face or something, but but, but nothing else. Like it, it's not uh, showing the dictation of your words on the screen, which I've always thought was really dangerous when you're driving. So they were smart. They, they turn that off when it's, you know, when it detects that you're driving. So that was good. Uh, but I told, I asked it the same thing. I said, Hey, launch ways. And it said, um, yeah, I, uh, you would need to unlock your iPhone first and I can't, Oh, actually it said, I can't do that while you're driving. And then I asked it to launch maps. So, you know, similar app, but one made by Apple, one made, but not by Apple. And it says you would need to unlock your iPhone first, but I don't recommend doing that while you're driving. It's like, well, I just asked you, like I asked it, you know, I didn't say just launch maps though. I said, Hey, get me directions home. So it was like a very all inclusive request. Like I, I want you to do something for me that makes perfect sense for me to do while I'm driving. And it was like, yeah, you need to unlock your phone first. And I can't, um, I, you know, I can't do that. Well, I, I don't recommend doing that while you're driving. So I'm not sure about any of this, John. Um, I, you know, it's frustrating. I guess, uh, I guess I could turn off allow access when locked. No, oh, I have all those things on though. If you go into settings and face ID and passcode or touch ID and passcode, depending on what feature your phone has kind of at the bottom of that, there's a thing, there's a section saying allow access when locked. And there's, you know, today view recent no notifications, control center, Siri, uh, home control, you know, return missed calls, that kind of thing. And I have them all turned on. So uh, it, it is the least secure mode you could be in. And it doesn't matter. So I might turn off re require attention for face ID so that maybe uh, it won't need me to look at the screen while I'm driving to get it to. So I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm turning that off. I'll, I'll report back. But <laughs> Crazy stuff, huh, John? Me, if you're going to fiddle with your phone, pull over. Yeah, ab right. Absolutely. No, I, I totally agree with you. Yes, absolutely. Ab I, that's, and that's what I'm saying is I would love to be able to just have it, you know, say, hey, bring me home without it saying, no, you, you must unlock me first. Yeah. Can we have an arrangement going on here? Like, would that be OK? I want voice recognition. In fact, why don't we have that? Waze supposedly does. No, I mean like voice print recognition. So that while I'm driving, oh. I could say, hey, unlock my phone. And it would say, yeah, okay. You know, like I'll do this only when you're driving. Right. So if do not disturb while driving is active and, you know, my voice, like I, I feel like that's, we have the tech to do that. Right. Hmm. Right. I don't know how reliable it is oh, or how I, foolproof it would be. Right. I don't think it's totally foolproof. It's not nearly as foolproof as like touch ID or, or face ID. But what if I was willing to, to make that compromise and say, okay, like don't trust my voice any other time, but while do not disturb while driving is on. Yeah, man, mm -hmm. trust my voice print, you know, I think like to me, that's, uh, I'm kind of liking this idea. I think we need to we need to champion this, John. Uh, do we have a a new thing? Is it uh, is it time? Like uh, if I do that, voice print while driving, right? Because you know we got iChat with tabs a decade ago by doing that, so now that's what we want, right? Are you still with um, me? Okay. Yeah, I'm just doing, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for something here because I had a thought in my mind about what this okay. uh, could be. Yeah. 
Well, well, we'll see if the reverb uh, effect can can get any results going. So uh, speaking of driving, we had an interesting conversation on our Facebook page, John, about, um, we, you know, we had talked on the show ab- about the Qi wire, uh, you know, the touch, whatever, Qi chargers, the wireless charging, I guess we call it wireless. It is wireless. Um uh, in in the uh, in the car mounts, right? So that you just put the thing in your car, and I love that, right? I I put it in my car, and it starts charging right away. But Ari on Facebook noticed something that is quite true. If you have your screen on and you're doing like GPS activity, like maps or whatever, uh, the Qi charging path is is not strong enough to actually charge the phone. At best, I mean, it charges it a little bit, but it basically keeps it from discharging, right? It's just enough to get enough power into it that it's not going to, you know, you're not going to lose charge by doing that, but you're not going to gain charge. Uh, Whereas with a lightning cable, you would. And so he said, yeah, so what I have to do is, you know, I get in my car and I have to unplug the, um, the cable from the Qi charger so that I can still use it as a mount. And then I plug a lightning cable into my phone. Well, here's the thing. I, I I did some testing. I took one for the team. Uh, I made a I made a guess, and I I I think I guessed right. But I left my Qi charger plugged in, and I plugged in a lightning cable anyway. And I am now certain that charging priority goes to lightning first, and then to Qi only if there's nothing uh, charging the phone v- v- via lightning. And the way I have deduced this is twofold. I've done this for hours. I, I had to drive down and back to like Princeton or whatever. And I did this and I didn't cook my phone or any of that stuff, um, which is a good sign. But also when you put your phone on charge, it, either it, you know, if it's, uh, if it's on mute, you feel the the little buzz. And if it's not on mute, you also hear the sound, right? So when I put my phone uh, on the Qi charger, it buzzes. Right. And then even while it's on the Qi charger, if I plug in the lightning cable, um, it also buzzes, which tells me it has changed chargers. Now, if I do it in the reverse, if I plug a lightning cable in, it buzzes. And if I put it on the Qi charger with the lightning cable already in, nothing happens. So it's not even trying to negotiate a Qi connection based on the uh based on the fact that the that it's already charging via lightning so it's up to the phone to negotiate this and it does not uh, i mean really it's up to both devices but the you know they both have to participate it's not just a i see a chi coil i'm going to barf power at it no that's not how it works it, there's a negotiation that happens and then it starts barfing power at it so i think you're totally fine if you if you want to uh switch to lightning for for that particular drive, just plug a lightning cable in. You don't have to unplug your Qi charger. It's going to be okay. Make sense, John? Huh. I'll have to play with this, but the way I check to see which one is active is Amazing Mini has this uh, info screen, and among the things it shows is if your phone is charging, how many volts and amps <clears throat> Because I was curious when I bought the uh, charging pad for mine. I'm like, gee, I wonder how much power it's offering. And it, it had some bizarre combination yeah. of voltage and current. It was like 700 milliamps of current, and the voltage is really weird. And it came out, I think, to like 6 watts. Okay. Okay. And but you get more si- than that if you uh, do a lightning connection. Yeah. I, I have found those reports with Qi charging to be... Uh, incorrect. Um, I, I like an unreliable in terms of it, it I, like it's reporting that there is charge happening and maybe it's reporting the maximum available from the cheap pad, but I've never re- like, it doesn't charge at that rate. Like a, a, the, your normal little charger is five Watts, right? The little wall charger thing. Um, uh-huh. the, the small one that comes with an iPhone and that charges your phone way faster than the Qi charger will. So maybe it's reporting the amount of power that the Qi charger is putting out, but the phone probably gets about half that because it's lost in translation. So maybe, maybe that's what's going on. I don't know. I like, you know, it, have you tried it with a, um, cause Apple phones support 
did they support the 15 or the 12 and a half? We had these numbers somewhere and now I'm forgetting them. Right. But there's, there's different amounts. There's like the 10 and then there's a, a 15 watt charger to uh cheek charger. And, and I think the Apple phones support up to that, but you know, only in their own mm. way, maybe somebody in the, uh, in the chat room can, can remind us yeah. at Mac. Well, um, yeah. So, yeah. But anyways, yeah. there's definitely different values, whether I'm on Chi or lightning and lightning is more and faster. That so. makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll buy that. And, and did you do this with a 10 watt charging pad, John? Mm, I'm not sure how much <coughs> mine is off the top of my head. Okay. It's probably 10 would be my guess. Um, there it is. Let's see. Samsung wireless charging pad. Let's see. Uh, if they give any information here. How many amps is it? I guess that's the, that's the question. Maybe it's only five watts, right? Cause one amp is if five volts. What's the formula, John? Uh, power equals current times voltage. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a, uh, yeah. So this is a 10 amp one to two amps, five volts. So two. Oh, you have a two amp one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, says. that's a 10 and you're okay. Interesting. Yeah. 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 No, I, I believe you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Huh. All right. Fun. Somebody else in the chat room helping out. Oh, Warren says, remember air power? Yeah, me neither. I'm with you on that, Warren. They, uh, that was a product that I think was conceived perhaps days before it was announced. Uh, it felt like a last minute addition to that keynote announcement. I think I said it at the time. Um, and uh, is perhaps the closest thing to vaporware that we've seen from Apple in a very long time. Uh, it's not their, their, uh, it's not their MO to do something like that. And yet it's very much felt like a, Hey, look at our concept design of, the, wouldn't you like one of these? Would I, we would like one of these. Wouldn't you like one of these? That would be cool. And then, you know, there you go. Where's it at? Where, where is it at? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, where are we here, John? Coming back around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, th th another related but but important topic. So, um, I I did agree with you as we just spoke about. Uh, if you need to mess with your phone, pull over. I I think we were in more agreement, but potentially than uh than our conversation led on in the last episode when we were talking about earphones and cycling and and all of that stuff. Uh, I, I think we both wound up, uh, or at least, at least I certainly wound up kind of digging my heels in on it and losing the point that I was trying to make. But, um, Allison Sheridan from, uh, from Nosilicast at podfeet.com wrote in and said, interesting debate on the headphones while cycling question in many States, including mine, it is illegal to have headphones on in both ears while driving anything. Bicycling, bicycling on the road is governed by the same laws that govern cars. I checked, she says, and in your two states, there is no such restriction. Uh, AAA keeps, uh, keeps tabs on all this. She says, it would suggest, however, that having headphones in your ears can impair your hearing more than speakers in a car, as she believes you were trying to say, John, which perhaps was what you were trying to say. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, I like, I'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, she says, Bart Bouchotts has a good solution. He uses bone conduction headphones and uh, uh, she says nothing blocking his ears at all. Uh, and uh, he avoids wind noise problems too. not great audio, but for podcasts, they works great. They work great. And she said he uses the aftershocks Trex titanium. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes so that, uh, so that we can all kind of be on the same page. But um so here, here's the thing. Uh, first and foremost, uh, yes, in case it wasn't clear in the last episode, I am not convinced that wearing two headphones while cycling is something that I could ever bring myself to do. 
whether it's a good idea or not, sort of even beyond that, like I can't, like I, 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 I'm not sure I would feel comfortable doing that even on backcountry roads, but certainly in anywhere where there's like cars, because when you're on a, like when you're in another car, when you're on a bike, you are, you have to assume you're invisible to every car you see, right? They cannot see you when you're in a car. That is also a good thing to assume and, and is sort of the, the foundational principle of defensive driving. But the reality is other cars do generally see you. And so chances are you've got somebody else also on the same page as you that doesn't want to crash into you and is working to avoid that and is looking to avoid that. Uh, whereas on a bike, that may or may not be the case. Um, that said, um, I'm I'm not convinced that non sealable headphones, so which is the conversation we had last week, you know, things like AirPods. Uh, would be any different than speakers in a car. So in, in that sense, I, I, I disagree. Um, because I, I, the, like, I often find myself either turning down or completely pausing the stereo when in high traffic, you know, density scenarios, like, or parking garages uh, or anywhere that I want to hear what's going on around me. Like I, I, the stereo cuts that out, uh, at least it, for my brain. I, it, it, yes, I could hear a, a horn, but I could also hear a horn with two headphones, especially non-scalable headphones into my ears on the bike. It's the distraction level of the radio. And I, I definitely find like if I'm on a highway drive, OK, fine. Everything that's happening is is predictable and the road's long enough where you can see and that sort of thing. But um, often as soon as I pull off the exit, it's like, whoa, this music's way too distract. Like I turn that off right away. So I don't, I don't know that, um, I don't know that it is any different, but, um, but at least not for me, I don't think so. So I don't know that are we, uh, what, what do you think, John? There you go. Um, no headphones or earphones when driving. That's what I think. But but I, do you notice that like music or whatever coming out of your stereo is also distracting like when you're when, when there's other cars around and you have to like negotiate things like that? No. Interesting. No, yeah. I don't listen to the I I guess I don't listen to music that that would uh <laughs> overrule my uh, awareness of what's happening. Sure. Yeah, okay. So it's just background noise. Yeah. Yeah. Classic rock, mostly. Well, but whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. you, you're not like for me when I, I can't listen to music without being like intently focused on on music. And, and the same would definitely be true right. of listening to podcasts. Right. I'm, I, I am aware of what's going on inside the song or I'm paying attention to what the podcast host is trying to tell me or whatever. And I like it. I can't have that as background. So. And so perhaps that's where that, that, that difference comes. And I realized, you know, our, all of us aren't wired the same way. And, and for many of you, you, especially you included John, you know, music can be a background thing. Like if somebody, if I'm in a car with somebody and they have the, they have music on, but it's at that level where you can barely tell what song is playing that. And I, and I know I'm, I'm in the minority on this. That to me is perhaps the most distracting volume level that could possibly exist. Because my brain is just trying desperately to pay attention to some level of that, and I can't. And so it's entirely distracting. It like takes all my focus away. It's like, can we just either turn it up or turn it off? And uh, but I, but again, I you know that's just me. So anyway, there you go. But I got to try those uh, those bone conduction things again. I'm not convinced they would make a whole lot of difference in, in, for this, but you know. I'd still want a way to pause it when I hit like, you know, mm -hmm. traffic lights or anything like that on a bike. Like I, I, you know, I don't want the distraction. So I don't know that yeah. I would ever. No, I, I tried some of the bike. bone conduction. Uh, there were a couple of them at a uh, CES. Yeah, it, it was. That, that's one thing that I actually, you know, occurred to me is, wow, I can still hear what's going on around me. Yeah. But I can also hear the music. Well, you're not really hearing. Well, you are kind of. Yeah. Yeah. You're hearing the vibrations, which is what hearing is, right? Right. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> just absolutely. via a different, just via a, a slightly different channel. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, but it's still getting in there. Yeah. 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 I just wonder who, whoever thought of that. Let's vibrate your bones so you can hear something. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, actually. 
So, all right. Fun discussion. Thank you, Allison. Especially thank you for that link about the laws. Uh, we've definitely got that in the show notes for you all. So very, very good stuff. You want to take us to Andrew, John? Actually, it was Tim that wrote this in. Oh, okay. So follow up to Andrew. So Andrew asked the question, how do I get an SSD for my aging 2009 X-Serve? And um, I would suggested one product, which is a bracket and in which you place an SSD, and then you plug it in the SATA 2 port inside your X-Serve. Right. That's a good solution. Um, but then Tim wrote in, and suggested another one, which I think I started going this path and then got distracted by something. Um, because the XServe, like older Macs, uh, often had more than one way to expand them. And uh, basically Tim said, well, I'm doing, um, well, here's what he said. He, he has 2009 XServe, it's chugging away, it's running 10.11.6 and Mac OS server. And he uses it for iTunes, Plex, Time Machine, um, calendar FTP. Wow. File sharing, caching. That's crazy. I guess he just can't run high Sierra because it's too old to run on it. Got it. Or I guess you can't easily install it. It'll say, no, your machine's too wimpy. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's an, if it's an X serve, it's not an Intel box, right? Oh, Where do they make I, Intel um, X serves. I no, no, it's a Xeon. Oh, okay. Oh, phone. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Sorry. But here's yeah. a solution that I, I just, uh, well, we'll let you know. This is an op another option. Uh, he added an SSD by using the OWC Excelsior S. Well, what's that, you ask? Well, it's a different way to, uh, it uses a different technology called PCIe or PCI Express. And the XServe had some slots. Um, the good news here is that this, so it's similar in concept in that you plug it into a port in your XServe, but PCIe, what this does is you plug in PCIe and it gives you a SATA 3 port because PCIe mm. is faster than SATA 2. So, um, so that's good news. That's cool. So if you want to kick it up, so if you want to, so if I had to choose between the two, I mean, there's still the pricing, um, you know, if you could afford one or the other, but I would say going with this would be a better choice um, if you want to go SATA 3. <laughs> and I think card itself is forty nine ninety nine, and then you put your own SSD in there. So, uh, huh. Cool. Yeah, kind of missed the days of expandable Max. Well, it, you know, um, Thunderbolt is that answer, right? It, a it, slot, I'm sorry, slot driven expansion let's say that <laughs> yeah but but okay but but i mean let's 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 just talk about expansion because i mean i get that the the process of putting things into a slot on the motherboard of a computer is is actually kind of a cool thing to do right but there is no practical difference between connecting something to the thunderbolt bus via a Thunderbolt connector, then there would be connecting to, you know, on, on a machine like that, the PCI buzz versus the PCI connector. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's, no, you're right. it's, a, it's right? a low level, low it's a low level, level yeah. high speed bus that you can plug different things into. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll go with you on that. You, you know what I mean? Like there's, if you're, if you're plugging in a Thunderbolt hard drive, for example, you are not plugging in a hard drive that has a Thunderbolt interface. You're plugging in, uh, usually it, well a box that has a hard drive in it and usually that hard drive is going to have a sata interface and then also in that box is a sata to thunderbolt interface and then that's what gets plugged in you know to 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 the thunderbolt port so in in pci terms essentially what you've done is you've gotten a sata card and plugged it into your pci bus and then you plug your hard drive into that right i mean that's that's a, it's essentially the same thing and therefore it makes, it, it does make things expandable. I, I think it's, it's not, again, it's not that same sort of romantic uh, process of, of like, oh yeah, there's the motherboard and I'm plugging something directly into it. Like, you don't get to see the motherboard with Thunderbolt. So, you know, it's not as, it, it doesn't feel the same, but, but it's the same, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, kind of, uh, I, I think back to the days when they had uh, 
Oh man, what was it called? P- uh, PCI remember the Express or whatever on the maybe laptops? it was PCI Express. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that that kind of general purpose? And you could get SSDs mm-hmm. and RAM and yeah, and all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, it was handy for sure. Yeah, people bought, built all kinds of cards, but not a lot of them sold. So it was, it was, it was short lived. Yeah, there were a few, few different ones. Right, right. Yep. Um, while we're on the subject, let's jump to Mark's question for this week, where Mark asked, uh, I've created a, uh, oh, never mind. Uh, he says, I have a question about SSD USB 3 enclosures versus Thunderbolt 2 mechanical drives. It's a bit of a quandary, he says, but I think that maybe a USB 3 enclosure with a fast one terabyte SSD will be better to use as a boot disc on my iMac than a Thunderbolt 2 tough drive with rotational drives inside. Let me know your thoughts. So I'm guessing that the reason we're sort of comparing, you know, apples to oranges here is we're not saying Thunderbolt versus USB 3 on an SSD or Thunderbolt versus USB 3 on a rotational drive. We're saying Thunderbolt rotational USB SSD. And I'm guessing, but I can't tell that cost is a factor here because my guess is that they might be similarly priced. Um, Maybe not, but you, you will pay more uh, if, if in fact this were say rotational drives with USB versus Thunderbolt, you're going to pay more for the Thunderbolt version because of uh, essentially what, well, what we call the Thunderbolt tax, but you know, you're buying uh, the extra interface, you're buying uh, the cable, right? None of which are cheap. Thunderbolt cables, in fact, are kind of ridiculously expensive, but because of the types of data that they need to be able to support. Uh, whereas USB doesn't come with that because it's not as low level a thing. And I think for a single drive, you're not going to see a lick of difference between USB three and Thunderbolt. Um, But there will almost always be a huge difference between the speed, the effective speed, uh, the perceived speed of an SSD versus a rotational drive, especially as your boot disk, where you've got lots of little files that need to load and lots of things happening all the time. You're not just, you know, barfing, video streams to or from the drive you're you know you're using it in many different ways sometimes simultaneously and uh and so for that i would definitely go for an ssd and that way you can avoid the thunderbolt tax in in your comparison scenario and go usb3 ssd and i i really don't think you'd notice a difference going usb3 ssd versus thunderbolt ssd in this scenario either with a single drive when you get into multiple drives Thunderbolt, you know, the, the throughput throughput thresholds are much, much higher, right? So in theory, you can, and, and also in practice, you can get much faster speeds out of Thunderbolt. But out of a single drive, you're, it's not going to happen uh, and probably not going to make a difference from your boot drive, even in a scenario where you could say, yes, okay, this drive on Thunderbolt's a little faster. So that's, uh, that's my thought. Nice little follow-up to the Thunderbolt discussion, I thought. But uh, what do you think, John? Yeah, I think it's all about the numbers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, USB 3, you're talking 5 gigabits per second. Right. And Thunderbolt, you're talking more, but you're going to be limited by the throughput of... USB 3 is good enough, I think. Fast enough for a single drive. Yeah, it right. It could you're... be a potential bottleneck because, all right, so 5 gigabits is 640 megabytes per second, and uh, some SSDs may exceed that, but... um. I think for most applications, it'd be fine. And yeah, as you pointed out, probably less expensive. Way, yeah, 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 yeah. I think, yeah. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. I, the, 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 that 640 uh, megabytes a second. Megabytes, right? 40 megabytes a second? Megabits. Correct me on this, John. It's early no, in megabytes. the day. Megabytes, Five right? Five gigabits, okay. 640 megabytes, or at least that's what the article is. Yeah, no, 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 says. that math makes sense. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, take a look at that. And say, yeah, okay. Like, is the drive going to go any faster than that? If not, then no reason to go with a, a connection method that would support faster speeds. So, yeah. 
There you go. Just be aware that USB three drives will potentially interfere with um, Bluetooth and oh yeah, and and two point four gigahertz Wi Fi. So just be aware of that, uh-huh. right? Because that because they they the frequencies are well multiples of each other, mm-hmm. and so they they get in the way. So just be aware of that. I had one guy um, at the P Mug meeting down in Princeton a couple of weeks ago that was like, yeah, you know, I, my Bluetooth mouse has worked for a long time and now it's gotten flaky. And I was like, Hey, did you add a USB three drive recently? He's like, yeah, why? I'm like, ha, try moving it to the other side of the computer or around or something so that, you know, it's not as likely to interfere. That can make a difference. Good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. All right, sweet. I want to uh, thank this week's Mac Geekab Premium subscribers. If you visit macgeekab.com slash premium, you can learn all about this. We really, really appreciate your support. I know we say it every single week, and it's because it's true. So this this week on our uh, monthly $10 plan, we received contributions from Jeff P., John V., Stephen A., John D., Santiago M., Ken L., and Gary B., thanks to all of you. We really appreciate it. And on the biannual $25 every six-month plan, we received contributions from Rick S., Harvey H., Ian T., John P., Mark P., no relation, Timothy B., and Jim D. Thank you to all of you. You, uh, you rock. If you want to learn more about it, go to, uh, like I said, MacGeekGab.com slash premium. And we have all sorts of information there for you. And uh, it's all working well. The credit card processor that we're using isn't uh, criminals anymore. We changed away from those and life is good. So very, very good stuff. All right. Um, Let's talk. Let's stay with the geeky stuff, shall we, John? And let's talk about APFS a little bit. Is that that a good place to go here for you? (laughs) No, it's been behaving. Good. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you've got a little bit of uh, history there with it. All right. Well, let's go to listener John, and uh, and then we'll we'll kind of move on from there. So John says he's running a 2012 27-inch iMac uh, with 24 gigs of RAM and an internal one terabyte hard drive. He says, I'm planning to get an external 500 gig SSD and then running a bootable USB installation to install a fresh high Sierra on that. And then I'll run it as my IMAX boot drive and leave the internal hard drive for data. So very similar to kind of to the scenario that we just kind of talked through. Uh, and that sounds great. Uh, I would do a USB 3 SSD uh, based on the previous conversation, John. Uh, he says, I'd like some advice on pre-formatting the SSD as APFS or HFS. Also, can you offer advice on whether or not it would be wise to leave the hard drive as bootable as a fallback precaution or just remove the OS from the hard drive? Okay, so two good questions. Uh, the first, I would do APFS on the external SSD, assuming that disk utility lets you. Sometimes it gets wonky, and it's because APFS is new. Um, I wouldn't, like, this isn't necessarily the hill to die on. If if disk utility does not let you do this, it's fine. You can convert to APFS down the road and use HFS Plus for now, but... Uh, assuming you don't run into any problems getting it formatted that way, yeah, I'd go with APFS for the uh, for the SSD. That, that's what it's built for. Would you would you uh, agree on that, John? Now I would. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, you had, but you had problems with a rotational drive, or uh, what was the? No, it was, was an SSD. Also. Oh, it was. Uh, no, it was just Drive Genius was just uh, getting a set because it was getting an error code. Hmm. But now all his life is good. I'm looking and yeah, I have, uh, I'm looking in the event log and I don't see those reports anymore. So, okay, uh, cool. Either Apple fix something or Microsoft fix something, or they probably both fix something. Right, right. Well, that's good. That, and that's, you know, like we've said all along with this APFS thing, it, it is, you, we are in the, you know, active evolution of APFS. So you've just got to kind of, Bear with that. Um, that's, that's, you know, it's just where we are. It's a very young file system. And so utilities and history and experience and all of that, you know, I mean, you heard John say, well, now I would recommend that. 
but he said, like you say that, but six months ago, it would, your advice would have been absolutely the opposite, maybe even three months ago. Right. So this is actively evolving. Well, because the utility was saying, you know, it's critical damage to your volume. And I'm like, uh, all right, let me try another tool. And it's like the other tool says everything's great. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I even did a, um, so Carbon Copy Cloner has a uh, verify option that you can run after a backup. And it basically compares every piece, as far as I can tell, it basically compares every piece on the source to every piece on the destination. And it said, yeah, looks looks the same to me. So huh. I'm like, okay, I, I don't think there's damage. Right, right. Huh. All right. Well, good. Um, in terms of leaving the internal drive bootable, uh, as a matter of course, I wouldn't do that. Um, it, I, I always find that having two bootable drives mounted at all times can get a little wonky. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having a clone. So if you want to partition part of that internal drive and use, you know, part of it as a clone and then part of it as your data, having a clone is good. And a clone by, you know, a clone of your boot drive will by definition also be bootable, but eject that. And only bring it online when the clone operation is happening. Um, that way things don't get confused and you don't, you're not winding up with, you know, using say a, a pages document on your clone instead of a pages document on your main drive, which can happen. I've seen it. I've, I've experienced it. So, but, and the good news is like, you know, our favorite cloning utilities like carbon copy cloner and, and super duper both support this, you know, mount clone eject process and in, in their own ways, but, the the net result is that the drive is only mounted when it's being cloned to, and then that's that. So, so that, that would be it. But otherwise, no, I wouldn't leave another OS there. I mean, I look, I know people that do and, and it's fine. And if you're happy managing that and just being aware of that and knowing that sometimes things are going to come up, especially when you're doing installations and it's going to ask you about different drives, that's fine. There may be a scenario, especially with an external boot drive, where if it doesn't mount fast enough, uh, the system may fall back to booting on the boot drive that it finds, which is internal. So have something change the desktop picture on that so that it is painfully obvious to you that you are not booted from your main drive. Um, I've seen customers with that, with my Dave, the nerd business where it's like, you know, it's like, Oh uh, yeah. Now I've like for three weeks now I've been booting from this old drive and now I've got this mess where I've got to, you know, merge things and put things back. And it's like, yeah, okay, let's not, let's, let's avoid that scenario. So, so that's where my advice comes from is just avoiding the scenario of confusion. But if you're, if you're willing to do it. And again, like I said, I changing the desktop background is sort of a, a, a nice way of instantly knowing that, Oh yeah. Whoop, I'm why am I booted from this? Right. You know, something. Right, John? Mm hmm Okay. I'm with you. All right, cool. Um, so I would do that. Uh, and, and then, but here's the big question, John, uh, because I, I shared this advice with John, and uh, listener John, and he wrote back and he says, okay, cool. How do I remove Mac OS from my drive, but still leave all my data on there? And I didn't have an instant answer for him, John. Oh, it's easy. Is it? Um, <laughs> Maybe it well, is. I don't know, you know how what to I do that. Uh, you know, I may try it on a on a on a duplicate. But um, how about whacking the system folder? That's not enough. You don't I, think I mean, so? it, it, no. I mean, it's it's a start, but it like. He's asking. I don't know if your drive is going to be bootable. If you can even whack the system folder without it getting upset. Right. Probably. No, you're 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 right about that. That whacking the system folder would make the drive unbootable, but it that wouldn't remove Mac OS from the drive, right? Like it, it. There's there's also what there's the. Hang on. You know what? Let me pull up to Finder. Oh no 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 no. no. New Finder window. Oh no. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Cool. System and library maybe. Yeah, well, okay, so I'm comparing a 
non-bootable drive with a bootable drive. And I've used our favorite little trick of command shift period in the finder to show me all hidden folders. So on the non-bootable drive, there are five hidden items. There's .ap disk, .fs events D, .spotlight V100, temporary items, and trashes. On the um, on the bootable drive, hang on, there one, two, three, four, five. Uh, there are twenty-two hidden items. Document revisions V100 file FS events D my SCM server info, which probably is related to some old app. I have PK install sandbox manager, which also might be related to some old app. I have um, spotlight V100 dot trashes. Okay. Dot vol bin cores Etsy uh, installer failure request net network opt private S bin TMP USR var uh yeah and then also the app and then there's the system folder which is not hidden there's library and there is applications all of which should also be removed unless you need something in the applications folder which you should probably move to your boot drive uh, right so this is like you know what just format it and copy your home directory i like that idea yeah copy your data yeah, i would i would yeah, yeah i would Copy your home directory somewhere else, mm -hmm. format the drive, and then copy it back, and then use that as your uh, data drive. I, e I but even then, I would say, like, if you look in your home directory, how much of that do you need, right? I mean, your documents folder, sure. Uh, do you need, you know, maybe your desktop folder, if you're someone that stores things on your desktop, which a lot of people do. I, I'm certainly one of you. Uh, the downloads folder, maybe. You know, but do you need your library folder? Maybe, depending on what you've got there. But you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of stuff. I, I like your idea of, of uh, it, really, the best would be to take that internal drive and clone it to something external, right? Then format the internal drive empty. And then only copy things back to that external drive that you need. So, you know, grab your documents folder, grab your desktop and downloads if you want and call them old desktop and old downloads so that you're not confused when you're navigating around. But then like, you know, only bring things back that, that you would need. So yeah. Brian Monroe has, uh, has another suggestion. He says, what about just using iCloud documents and iCloud photos to sync everything via the cloud? And then maybe you don't need anything. Um, it, that, well, so the problem with that is it's going to want to put all that stuff by default on his new boot drive. And the goal is not to do that, right? The goal is to keep things separate so that he's not filling up his new boot drive with things that don't need to be on the SSD. So it's, yeah, it's not an easy, it's not an easy process, right? Interesting. Curious. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good point because actually the way I'm set up, yeah, I was looking in my uh, user directory and uh, I didn't have a documents folder. I'm like, huh, why is that? Oh, because I'm storing it in the cloud. Oh, right. Well, because it moves it to your iCloud directory. Right, right, right. Yeah. So actually, you may have already solved the problem for yourself. If it's that's possible. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And you can't relocate that directory. Right. Like if he wants his iCloud documents folder to be somewhere else, is that, um, uh, can you relocate that? I don't think, uh, I have, uh, I have that folder in my sidebar. Sure. Well, right. Just for quick access. But I mean, could he put it on a different drive? But no, I don't, I don't think you get any flexibility. I think by default it, um, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know that he I don't I don't know. Yeah, so Brian Monroe is is pointing out in the chat room that it's it's way too easy for as he calls himself Brian the IT guy or Dave the nerd type folks to overthink these things. And he's right, but that's of course what we do on this show, which is, you know, why Brian's a listener. Uh because we like to talk through these things, but but he's right that that using iCloud documents and iCloud photos and then setting it to optimize storage will not download, it will not fill up your drive, right? Because it, it intentionally will 
will not download all your documents. But if you want local copies and you have all this storage right there, well, then I don't blame you. Like, I would want that, too. It's part of the reason that I haven't uh, moved to all that. So, yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is here. I, I would like to be able to relocate the um, iCloud Drive. There's got to be a way, right? Uh, iCloud Drive on external drive. Yeah. How many people have solved this problem? Uh... Well, yeah, it's doable. We will, uh, we will visit this in a future episode, but, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a no. I think it's a no. If anybody knows, let us know. Uh, feedback at macgeekgab.com is the, uh, is the place to send that type of information, John. Call it a geek challenge. about are you sure that it's feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I am sure that it is feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Unless, unless you are a premium subscriber and then you get to use premium at MacGeekGab.com, which, uh, you know, we answer first. We pay, uh, pay more attention to. Not that we don't pay attention to everything else. You know, we, we our goal and we hit it nearly every week because our systems are in place to hit this is that uh, unless the systems break down, which means we're traveling or whatever, but otherwise we, we get to everything every week. However, uh, the folks that are on the premium list are get priority. There you go. That's the, cause you know, that's how it works. Uh, all right. So, uh, so that's that you can visit us on Facebook. If you go to Mac slash Facebook, but uh, we have started our uh, alpha test of the new uh, Q&A system that we're implementing locally uh, here at MacObserver.com for us at MacGeekGab because Facebook is kind of terrible for Q&A type systems, to be perfectly honest. So, uh, so we've got quite a few of you from Facebook over there. If you want to join that alpha test, that's, it's great. I, I actually want it to be fairly large. Because I want it to be representative of all of you, so uh, so we can get you access to the alpha server, and you know you can start commenting and playing with it, and just putting data in and messing with it, and letting us know, and and we'll work together to get it to be the system that we want it to be, and then very soon we'll just move it over to the live server, and and uh, and there we go. It's you know we're off and rolling. So check it out. Let us know. Uh, what else you got, John? Anything? Hmm. I'm talking to my TiVo. Okay, how are you doing that? Oh, they uh, they added a skill. I got an email about it. They're like, oh yeah, you didn't get an email about that? No, I did. I was just going to let you tell the story. I well, said it all up too. To tell. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it uses the Amazon device, the A Lady, that uh, that lets you talk to your TiVo. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, pause. And it paused, and I'm like, okay, that works. My only concern is if my volume of my system is too high, she can't necessarily hear me or hear what I'm saying. So I'm thinking, is this a feature I'm going to be using that often? Yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's I like, do. I, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in. Now I'm in left field with you, which is great. This is one of the things that I love about you. Because, you know, here we are in the outro to the show. I was asking perhaps if maybe there was, you know, Twitter accounts that you wanted to mention or anything. And now we're, we've got yet another topic going while the band's playing, which is cool. I like it. It's good. It, it is. It is one of the things that makes doing this show an absolute blast. But, yeah, uh, I set it up. It's not as full featured as the TiVo Vox remote, though. Uh, it, it, it In that with that thing, I can, you know just press the voice button on it and say hey you know uh you know find me all the chevy chase movies or whatever and boom it finds them all for me right and so or just say the name of a tv show like i want to watch the royal wedding and boom it you know it'll it'll find it for you if, if for whatever reason that's your thing you know so so there you go you can't do that with the uh, the skill that they added for the uh, the a lady this week but it may, but i wouldn't surprise me if it gets there right so yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Anything else? He asks 
with trepidation? Nope. Are you sure? <laughs> Come on, it gets fun. All right. Well, there you go. I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, Eero that we mentioned during the episode, MGG. Uh, saves you and gets you overnight shipping for free. We have uh, sponsors like, what just happened? What did I do? I hit the wrong button. Let's try that again. Let's get the band rolling. Come on, band. Let's go. There they are. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have sponsors like Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. We have sponsors like OWC at maxsales.com. Bare Bones, celebrating their 25th anniversary of BB Edit at barebones.com. Very, very good stuff. Fun stuff. I like it. New sponsors coming, too, which is always good. Visit our sponsors. You don't necessarily have to buy it. Go to macgeekgov.com slash sponsors and visit them. That helps us immensely, believe it or not. They, they, they like to see that you are visiting them. So please do that. John, anything else? I got one, not one, not two, but three things for you, Dave. Uh-oh. All right. Those well, three things I'm waiting are, with bated breath. Those three things are don't get caught. Made up.